Hello and welcome to part two for Business Ethics, Chapter 8. Chapter 8 is Recognizing and Respecting the Rights of All. Last time we talked about some of the highlights of having diversity on your workforce and some of the challenges. In part 8.2, we're going to talk about accommodating people with different abilities and people of different faiths. So first, people of different abilities. Here in this picture, we have someone with a service dog, and our caption tells us that many people with service animals can easily fulfill job functions just with a little bit of assistance. The next slide goes straight to cases from the real world, but first we're gonna think about some a theme that we've been thinking about all semester. The difference between legal compliance of ethical issues and going above and beyond by creating a set of ethical standards in your own company uh, based on the values and goals of your company. When it comes to people with different abilities, the legal requirements are set down by the Americans with Disabilities Act in the United States, which was passed in 1990. Their definition of someone with a disability is that if he or she has a physical or mental impairment that reduces participation in a quote unquote major life activity, which of course work is. And the ADA also says that people cannot be discriminated against in their employment and employers for candidates that are qualified and have the appropriate skills uh, must have reasonable accommodations made for their disability. What's a reasonable accommodation? Well, the opposite of that for businesses is undue hardship. That's U-N-D-U-E, meaning the accommodation of someone's needs would create a real financial or other logistical issue for the company, it would harm the company itself to provide that accommodation. I actually have a close friend who is a disability rights advocate, and she has educated me over the years on just how hard it can be to navigate New York City, which is thought of as a navigable city for people with disabilities. Uh, you might imagine that if you're in a wheelchair and you have to get to work every day, you will have to find a subway, that a station that is accessible to you, meaning it has an elevator. And that might not be the station that's closest to your apartment. So you're gonna have time added on to your commute right there. And then you might go to the next stop in the station where you know there's an elevator and it might be out of service, which is gonna add more time onto your commute. And then even when you get down onto the platform, a lot of them that are deemed accessible are still very narrow when those columns come next to the, the side or the, there's bumps and cracks everywhere you need to navigate to get on the train. And that's just one subset of people with disabilities. There are people with low vision or low hearing um, that could all have a smoother commute if uh, the ADA was taken a bit more seriously than Americans with Disabilities Act and reasonable accommodations were implemented. I say all this as a caveat to this case from the real world in which Verizon was sued in 2011 for discriminating against people with disabilities with its severe and strict attendance policy. Not only did you have to come to work, you had to come to work exactly on time or you were punished. And with that example that I had told you, saying that maybe you are a wheelchair user trying to get to work on the subway, things that are out of your control have prevented you from coming in on time that day. So they did form a class action suit and Verizon had to pay out $20 million to settle that suit because they were deemed to have not provided reasonable accommodations because of this super strict attendance policy. What about accommodating a workforce with a wide variety of religions? In the United States, here is a sample calendar. Religious holidays are in green. 
red holidays there are federal holidays for everyone. And you can imagine as a manager or someone in charge of setting the schedule that this could get really complicated, especially if one of the busy times for your industry is highlighted here. <clears throat> that undue hardship thing comes back into play, excuse me for that, with this. So you might be doing your best to provide reasonable accommodations for people's religions and religious holidays, but there might be a certain time where your scheduling is so complicated and confused that you can't give someone off the day that they requested because otherwise there might be undue hardship, like you wouldn't have any staff. So it's a balancing act. There's another interesting example. I don't know if they have it in here. No, this is the Juneteenth one. There's one where um, the Sikh faith requires that the men within the faith carry a dagger. And there are some places in the United States that have made religious accommodations allowing Sikh men to bring a dagger into work. But you can imagine how other employees might not feel comfortable with their coworker bringing a weapon to work every day. And they're the difficulties of the celebration of diversity come into the fore again. In the what would you do here, they want you to think about, put yourself in the place of an executive who has scheduled a barbecue that people look forward to and people like every year, but you unthinkingly or unknowingly schedule it on June 19th, which is also Juneteenth, a holiday that has been growing in popularity to celebrate over the last decade or so. And it's a celebration of the end of slavery in the United States. And your African-American employees are looking forward to the barbecue just as much as your other employees are, but they come and say, hey, we wanna celebrate Juneteenth also. What can you do? And what would you do? What sorts of factors would you have to consider trying to help a portion of your employees celebrate two things at once while still accommodating the rest of the workforce celebrating the barbecue. This one's interesting. I'll leave you to look at it on your own time. Abercrombie and Fitch was sued uh, because a Muslim uh, applicant w was wearing the hijab and Apparently head coverings were banned and this was sued for religious discrimination and they won. Section 8.3 of recognizing and respecting the rights of all sexual identification and orientation. The things that we've looked at thus far, gender, um, religion, disabilities, have all been protected classes by federal law. However, sexual identification and orientation are not included in the Civil Rights Act and thus has, their rights of discrimination have been left to the states. And as you can see, it's probably not too much of a surprise. The states that have enacted laws that prohibit discriminating based on sexual orientation and identification are the ones that normally vote Democrat whereas the ones that haven't are the ones that normally vote Republican. There's a third class here with these blue states on this particular graphic, Pennsylvania, Michigan, Montana, Indiana, and Delaware, that prohibit discrimination in public facing companies, but not in private offices. If you were a prospective employee that identified as LGBTQ+, there are ways and means and pieces of information that can tell you where it might be better for you to look for a job um, to make sure that you are not discriminated against based on your orientation or identification. And one of them is this, the Human Rights Campaign Foundation publishes every year. Uh, they study the companies and 
all the states that I think have above 500 employees or something like that, and they rank them on a scale of zero to 100. And the percentage of businesses that score 100, that's what this number is. A little bit of a surprise to me, Maryland came out as number one, New York down in the middle here, 53, California even lower, 49. Section 8.4, income inequalities. So what does respecting and recognizing human rights have to do with income inequalities? Well, you can think of it like this. Uh, I mentioned a bit at the top of the chapter how rights evolved to show that we are equal as human beings. We're not equal in skills. We're not equal in genetics. Uh, we have different health issues or looks or, you know, the, a lot of this stuff is look oriented underneath it all. We're all human beings and we all have the same rights. And what, what does that mean? We're equal under the law. What other interpretations of equality are, hey, we need equal opportunity. This isn't to say, again, that everybody's going to be wealthy or everybody's going to be successful, but that everyone from birth should have the right and the chance to decide what their goals are and pursue them. And there are lots of different ways we can structure economies and communities in which people can't. If you work full time and you can't meet your own basic needs, rent, food, electricity, transportation, then something is wrong. The community is organized in such a way that you don't really have a shot. Things can get even worse in which you might imagine being born in a country that's at war. You wouldn't have the opportunity to go to school. You wouldn't have the opportunity to feel safe. You might not have clean water. Uh, in that instance, you, you're definitely out of luck when it comes to equality of opportunity. And if income inequalities get so bad, such that you don't have this in, uh, equality of opportunity anymore, you're depriving a large section of a population of their right to a free and happy life. This is income inequality in the United States as of 2015. Sometimes it's hard to take in the importance of a bar graph here. We see it goes straight up like this. Look at this number, 90%. This is the income of 90% of 375 million Americans. So that's a good 350 million people, right? Right in this tiny little, little bar here. This is the top point. 1% making nearly $7 million a year. And for a lot of people, this isn't fair. For a lot of people that are committed to market capitalism, they still say, okay, within a market capitalism, within a market economy, you should be able to use your labor to build some wealth, even if it's not this kind of wealth. If you're born down here, you should still be able to live a decent life. And that is why our book argues that income inequality is definitely a human rights issue. Not only that is the middle class has been shrinking. The middle class um, is a conception that is tied intimately into ideals of the American dream. The idea that you might not be extremely wealthy or rich or powerful, but you are going to be able to live a decent life. And even apart from ideals, um, the middle class in America, at least since the early 1900s, late 1800s, has been the driver of economic growth. They're the ones with the disposable income to spend on the marketplace, on goods and services. So as the middle class disappears, purchasing power in the entire economy goes down and the economy doesn't grow. So it's both an ethical issue and a bottom line issue.
we get a section in our textbook about corporate leaders coming to economists and recognizing that the so-called death of the middle class is not sustainable and that there is a purely economic reason to fix such drastic levels of income inequality. This is where oftentimes when I teach this class or when I teach, or, well, classes similar to it, where we're talking about justice and freedom and equality of opportunity, where I like to tell students about the differences in scales. Our brains are just not well equipped to understand very large numbers as human beings. We don't encounter things that really affect our day that have very, very large numbers. Um, so whenever things jump up an order of magnitude, we think, oh yeah, okay, that, that's, that's a big number going to another big number. Uh, but the difference between a million and a billion is bigger than you might think. So if you sat down right now and you tried to count to a million, zero, one, two, three, one number every second, it would take 12 days, 11 to 12 days to count from zero to a million. Annoying, but doable. And then you might think, well, okay, we're going to jump up to a billion. How long do you think, take a, a moment in your head to try and think how long it would take one number per second to count to one billion? And you might guess, I don't know, a couple months, a year, when in reality it is 31 years. It would take you 31 years to count to an, one billion compared to 12 days for a million. So when people make the argument that income inequality is so huge that it's unsustainable and unethical. These are the kinds of things that they're thinking about. Uh, having billions of dollars of wealth when some people are working their butts off every single day and can barely afford electricity seems like an ethical issue. This is Ethics Across Time and Culture. I'll leave that one to you for your work this week if you're interested in it. And we'll move on just to the last section in the book, 8.5, Animal Rights and the Implications for Business. So we've been talking about human rights. What about animal rights? Uh, you might recall that when we talked about the environment in our special stakeholders chapter, we encountered the argument that maybe the environment needed uh, legal representation. Just like corporations have some of the rights of individuals in limited circumstances, there's nobody to embody the environment and fight for it unless we enact it in law and say, hey, it has some rights itself to make sure that we are careful and we sustain our natural resources. And a similar argument goes for animals and animal rights. Perhaps an even stronger one because so many animals are sentient. Sentience means the ability to sense. So sight, smell, taste, touch. More importantly, perhaps pain, pain and suffering. Um, this jumps ahead quite a bit again. So first we'll take a look at a brief history of the animal rights movement, very, very brief, in the beginning of section 8.5. Talks about um, the movement beginning when the ASPCA and the Humane, so Humane Society were first established in the 1950s. Of course, there were some people advocating against animal cruelty before then, but this was sort of met when the social movement began to solidify in the United States. And we've made progress but there are still significant issues. Even if you recognize that people 
are likely to continue to eat meat in the in the near future there are still ethical ways that we can tend to the issues surrounding the raising caretaking and slaughter of the meat that we use for food uh, in on that particular question there are many meat eaters that protest the conditions in massive corporate agribusiness so i'm not sure if any of you have ever seen videos of some of the factory farms that are out there i'm not recommending that you go look at them but they are um they can be shocking where in there are thousands of animals crowded into one small pen and they're they're sick or they're dying and their bodies are left there and even if you didn't think animals had rights, this could have direct implication on human health for how this meat is being raised, or these animals are being raised for meat, is eventually going to get brought to the consumer. Um, so one of the animal rights issues, totally apart, or I should say ethics of animal use in business, one of the issues apart from animal rights is human health and safety safe food production. I've talked a little bit about responsible use of natural resources, sustainability. Responsible animal husbandry is a specific subset of how you treat animals and that's how you breed them and there are unethical ways that you can do that that harm the animal and ultimately may harm human beings as well. Um, so you have all these different viewpoints. One comes from the idea of human health and safety and protecting that. Another comes from the environmental safety and sustainability. And then the third one is, of course, cruelty to animals itself. And that's just agribusiness. There's also medical and cosmetic research and ideas of how we might regulate that. There are many countries in the world, some you would expect, like Western Europe, some you might not expect that are outside of Western Europe, um, just with trends. Uh, that have totally banned the animal testing for cosmetic purposes, not for medical purposes, but for toiletries, basically, testing shampoo and makeup. Um, but the United States is not one of them yet. There may be business pressures to do so, such as all these other countries that have banned it. If they're still testing on animals in that way in the United States, they won't be able to sell their products in Western Europe or these other countries. So again, parallel ethical business ethical issues and business issues that put pressure on people to modify their ethical practices based on consumer demand then we get a picture of a chimp who people have been advocating for legal rights for for a while we get some cases for the real world this stuff is kind of hard for me to talk about um, Beagles are very often used as the lab testing animals for uh, cosmetics and for medical testing. And there is a specific not-for-profit, the Beagle Freedom Pro Project, to try and fix some of the ethical issues that come along with that. And this, again, you could answer for yourself in your homework for the week. And right there, I'm going to wrap up Chapter 8. Please email if you have questions or comments, and I'll see you in the next video next week.